What were the ideas of some of the humanist existentialists? Hans Jonas, 1903-1993, was influenced by phenomenology as well as existentialism. But some of his most original work has been directly relevant to environmental concerns and thought about the nature of life. In the Imperative of Responsibility, 1979. He argues for ethical responsibility for the planet to fight the incursions of technology. In The Phenomenon of Life, 1966, he argues against standard biological approaches that objectify living things and seek to explain their behavior via mere chemistry or mechanistic hereditary forces. Jonas' positive thesis is that all life forms, even single cells, have some form of awareness and they strive from their own physicality and perspective on the world. Awareness on a cellular level does not imply the presence of the cogito a mind it is. Sufficient if the living entity behaves in a way that enhances its life, or attempts to do so. Emmanuel Levinas, 1905-1995, was a French Jewish philosopher who was originally from Lithuania. Lavinas criticized the philosophical tradition in which things other than an individual mind are represented to that mind in ideas or some other mental content. He thought that the paradigm for understanding consciousness was the face-to-face -face interactions between human beings. Such interactions are both particular and indescribable, as well as of inestimable importance. Lavina's main works are Totality and Infinity, 1964, Otherwise Than Being or Beyond Essence. 1974, Difference and Transcendence, 1999, and Between Us, 1998. Albert Camus, 1913 to 1960, like Søren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, had a burning question. How did René Descartes' philosophical work begin? On November 10, 1619, Descartes spent many hours sequestered in a room-sized stove in a town in southern Germany. Such very large stoves with shelves, places to sleep, and room to stand up in them were built in Germany and Russia, until the end of the 19th century. Descartes had an epiphany as the result of three bizarre dreams, which set him on a course to create a new system for science and philosophy. His inspiration was that, beginning with a few ideas known to be absolutely true, and careful methods of reasoning with them, the basic principles of all of the sciences could be logically derived from those ideas. Descartes would go on to live briefly in Paris in 1628, before moving to Holland, where he was to remain for the rest of his life. What was the importance of Jewish philosophy in medieval thought? Moses Maimonides, or Moses son of Maimon, 1135-1204, who is also referred to as Rabbi Moses ben Maimon. Rambam, 
had an extensive influence on subsequent Jewish scholarship, the ideas of Thomas Aquinas, c. 1225 to 1274, and many scholars thereafter. Maimonides, like Averroes, c. 1126 c. 1198, was born in Cordoba, Spain, and, also like Averroes, pursued an intense interest in Aristotle. While he intended his writings to be restricted to Jewish readers, his insights about the relationship between monotheistic religious beliefs and classical philosophical insights were studied by both Catholic and Islamic thinkers, as well as Jewish philosophers and theologians. What is an epicycle? An epicycle is a type of circular motion that is not observed but, rather, theoretically postulated. From the postulation, what could be observed became predictable. Which was how it saved the appearances, or was consistent with what was observed. In the Ptolemaic system, the eighty epicycles were necessary to account for the different speeds and directions in the observed movements of the Moon, Sun, and five known planets. They also explain differences in how far the planets appeared to be from Earth at different times. The planets themselves were believed to move in small circles, which themselves moved along deferents, or large circles. Both the epicycles and deferents moved counterclockwise in planes, approximately parallel to the plane on which Earth was situated. Who were the philosophical rationalists? The philosophical rationalists believed that there was a priori knowledge about the world or general truths about the world known by the mind, without experience. This was in contrast to the empiricist insistence that all of our knowledge about the world was based on experience, sensory information in particular. The 17th century philosophical rationalists, such as René Descartes, 1596-1650, were opposed to the intellectual methods of the empiricists, but they still took science into account in their philosophies. Descartes was actively involved in scientific exploration and experimentation throughout his philosophical career. In the late 18th century, David Hume's 1711-1776 empiricism posed a special problem for Immanuel Kant. 1724 to 1804, because Hume, 1711 to 1776, applied skepticism to basic beliefs that many had taken for granted before him, such as the existence of God and the powers of natural causes to bring about their effects. In the 19th century, modern reactions against empiricism took hold in the Work of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900. And early existentialist philosophers, such as Søren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855. These reactions shared a concern for the validity of a priori truths and religious knowledge.
what was the purpose of Descartes' meditations? In his preface and introduction to Meditations on First Philosophy, 1641, Descartes said that his goal was to rationally prove the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. He claimed to be able to do that using his method of clear and distinct ideas, which would also enable him to create foundations of certainty for the sciences. What are the pitfalls and promises of experimental philosophy? In its degenerate forms, experimental philosophy could resemble philosophy by opinion poll. But that is not its goal or method. Rather, the view is that before relying on ordinary intuitions, philosophers should check what non-philosophers actually believe. That is, if philosophical theories depend on a certain view of intuitions, then philosophers should begin with the empirically accurate view. They should make sure that when they say the public thinks X, that the public does think X. The promise of philosophy is that experimental philosophy has the potential to make social and political philosophy more scientific. This does not deprive philosophers of the freedom to construct theories that explain why ordinary intuitions are incorrect. Insofar as they are complex judgments and not mere expressions of taste. Recent work in experimental philosophy includes Joshua Nob and Sean Nichols. Experimental philosophy, 2008, Joshua Nob, Intentional Action in Folk Psychology. An experimental investigation in philosophical psychology, 16. 2003, and K. Anthony Appiah, Experiments in Ethics, 2008. Critical responses to experimental philosophy include, Ernest Sosa. Experimental philosophy and philosophical intuition, in philosophical studies. 132. 2006, Kirk Ludwig, The Epistemology of Thought Experiments, 1st vs. 3rd Person Approaches, in Midwest Studies in Philosophy, 31, 2007, and Anticopinon. The Rise and Fall of Experimental Philosophy, in Philosophical Explorations, 10, 2007. What was George Santayana's ontology? He rejected the kind of philosophical skepticism about physical reality that had led to idealism. But he thought one positive effect of that skepticism was to show that essence is what is ultimately real. However, people can't experience pure essences. Our animal faith posits a world beyond our immediate experience. That world is made up of essence and matter, and also truth and spirit. Matter is constantly changing, but it has a continuity, which renders it a substance. Truth is about matter and what exists, whereas spirit is pure transcendental consciousness. Spirit intuits. 
Santa Yana described intuition as the direct and obvious possession of the apparent without commitments of any sort about its truth, significance, or material existence. What is ancient cynicism? The cynics were eccentrics who chose to be outcasts rather than kowtow to social norms that did not make sense to them. Ancient cynicism was generally an attempt to reassert the importance of human nature as independent of society and custom. This was very different from our modern definition of a cynic as someone who is skeptical and tends to believe the worst about people. The cynics derived from Antis thence of Athens, c. 445 to 360 BCE, who studied with Gorgias. c. 485 to 380 BCE, and was a good friend of Socrates, 460 to 399 BCE. Even being present at his death. Antis thence claimed to be proudest of his wealth, because, having no money, he was pleased with what he had. He thought that a virtuous person could always be happier than a non-virtuous one and that the soul was more important than the body. Antisthenes minimalist ideas about what was necessary to live well were carried on by Diogenes of Sinope. 400 to 325 BCE, who lived in a wine barrel, claimed that cannibalism and incest were fine practices. And was said to carry a lamp in daylight in search of an honest person. Diogenes' successor was Crates of Thebes, fluid 328 BCE. Who gave up his wealth to practice cynicism, but also married. He believed that asceticism was necessary for independence. And claimed that lentils were better than oysters. Who were the main social Darwinists? William Graham Sumner, 1840-1910, professor at Yale, was the American version of the English evolutionist Herbert Spencer, 1820-1903. Sumner was a strong advocate of unrestricted capitalism. He was famous for his essay The Man of Virtue which promoted self-interest as a primary duty for individuals. The industrialist Andrew Carnegie, 1835-1919, built on these ideas in his The Gospel of Wealth, which further enshrined the law of competition as a natural principle of progress. What were Plato's dialogues? Plato's surviving written works span a period of about 50 years. He wrote in the form of elegant, dramatic, and poetic dialogues, which scholars usually divide into different periods. The Apology, Charmids, Crito, Eupyphro, Hippias Minor, Ion, Laches, and Protagoras, taken alphabetically, are considered his early works. 
The middle works are the Phaedo, Symposium, Republic, and Phaedrus, believed to have been written in that order. And these were followed by later works of the Sophist, Statesman, and Philebus. Plato's Timaeus may fall somewhere either in the middle or late writings. His letters, numbered I through 13, were written toward the end of his life. Only letters 3, 7, 8, and 13 are unquestionably genuine, as is his will. There were no printing presses in Plato's day and no bookstores or libraries in Athens at the time he wrote. His dialogues probably reached their audiences through oral performances. And it is likely that Plato himself enacted the role of Socrates. What is metaphysical idealism? Metaphysical idealism is the position going back to the pre-Socratics and brought to fruition by Plato in the ancient world that what is ultimately real is something non-material and not apparent to the senses. Insofar as God was believed to be both non-material and most real. All Christian philosophers were idealists, but the term is usually reserved for those who posited mind or other non-material substances and things as more real than matter in the natural world. Who was Ernest Nagel? Born in Czechoslovakia, Ernest Nagel, 1901-1985 Lived in the United States after 1910 and was a member of the Columbia University Philosophy Department for over 40 years. His The Structure of Science, 1961 Is probably the last important logical positivist account of scientific investigation. Nagel extended the principles of the covering law model, whereby explanation is based on a generalization that has been inductively built up for the social sciences. He argued that although historical events are unique and non recurring, historical explanation implies that such events would happen again, given the same conditions and proven generalizations. How have Japanese, Chinese, and Indian philosophy recently entered Anglo-American philosophy? Asian philosophy came to the West as Buddhism from Japanese. Chinese and Indian philosophy, and Neo-Confucianism from Chinese philosophy. Given the common thread of Buddhism throughout Asia, many might be tempted to designate all philosophy from Japan, China, and India as Asian philosophy or Eastern philosophy. But there are other systems of thought and religion just as diverse as Buddhist traditions. Also, the different Buddhist traditions derive from cultures that have very distinctive histories as well as very different current political and economic situations and ties to the West. That their theological dimensions are not Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, is probably all that the philosophies of these areas broadly understood to be more than Buddhism and Confucianism have in common. 
although Euro-American intellectuals in other fields have well developed. Scholarly traditions based on Eastern texts, it should be noted that philosophers as a profession, are relative latecomers to Eastern philosophy. For instance, the British biochemist Joseph Needham, 1900-1995, wrote extensively on technology and science in the history of China, the 19th century German novelist Hermann Hesse introduced an international readership to Indian thought and Buddhism in his 1922 novel Siddhartha, and philosophy's own Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, was fascinated by Chinese thought. The question is what do philosophers put on their curricula from Eastern thought in new ways that emphasize a commonality of philosophical interests? Again, the answer is Buddhism, on account of its resonance with Western metaphysics and epistemology and Confucianism for what it teaches about virtue ethics. Did John Dewey hold views on education for children? Yes, and some have considered this unusual in a philosopher. He was married twice and had six children himself and adopted three. Although Dewey did not want to be known as an educator, because it would detract from his philosophical reputation. His contribution to education was at least as lasting as his philosophical innovations. When Dewey began to consider education, School children were expected to sit quietly and absorb information passively. While Dewey did not believe in a completely child-centered method of instruction, he emphasized the activity of learning, with an understanding that children are already curious and energetic participants in common, ordinary life outside the classroom. Dewey thought that children should be taught skills to solve problems, including moral problems. When he became chair of the Department of Philosophy, Psychology, and Education at the University of Chicago, he founded the Laboratory School. It was based on his theory of education, the motto of which was learn by doing. However, he acknowledged practical advice from Ella Flagg Young, the first woman president of the National Education Association, who was able to translate his ideas into actual practices and exercises in the classroom. He was also in contact with Jane Addams, who had co-founded the educational mission at Hull House. Dewey spent considerable time there himself. Talking to working people about their problems and aspirations. His 1899 The School and Society was a bestseller. Dewey's subsequent works on education were The Child and the Curriculum. 1902, How We Think, 1910 and Democracy and Education, 1916. More develop his common sense philosophy? Moore's first major article was the refutation of idealism. 
which was published in Mind in 1903. In it he argued that no idealist or skeptical argument was as convincing as common sense beliefs that the world is real. And that, therefore, idealism and skepticism can just be dismissed. Moore became famous for proving the existence of the external world with his legendary two hands argument. Derived from his 1939 proof of an external world. Argument against skepticism concerning the existence of the external world. Moore said that by raising his right hand and saying, here is a hand. And then raising his left and saying, and here is another, the skeptical position was disproved. This was not as offhand a dismissal as it seems. Moore's premise was that he knew he had two hands. From which it followed that the external world existed. From which it followed that there was no ground for the skeptic's doubt about its existence. How did feminist epistemology develop? Nancy Codoro, 1944, showed in The Reproduction of Mothering, 1978. How social roles within the nuclear family are reproduced socially by girls. Identifying with their mothers and boys becoming unlike their mothers. Recognition of the social construction of female gender resulted in. Broad rejection of biological determinism of women's traditional roles. This cleared the way for feminists to seek social causes for the disadvantageous status of women. Carol Gilligan's 1936, in a different voice, 1982, criticized Lawrence Kohlberg's account of moral development because it left out the relational nature of girls' moral perceptions. In contrast to the more abstract and individualistic nature of boys' moral development, the idea that women had relational identities led to an ethics of care most notably based on Stanford University psychologist Nell Nodding's Caring, 1982, which was foundational for the work of Sandra Lee Bartka in Femininity and Domination. 1990, and Eva Kitte's Love's Labor, Essays on Women, Equality, and Dependence, 1999. Genevieve Lloyd's The Man of Reason, Male and Female in Western Philosophy, 1984. Sparked a view that philosophy itself had been identified with distinctively masculine capabilities of reason to the intellectual as well as literal exclusion of women. These perspectives led to the articulation of feminist epistemology. Stressing connected, rather than individual knowers, or people who learn and come to know things. And the role of emotion and action in knowledge. The collection of papers in Linda Alcoff, 1955, and Elizabeth Potter's, 1947. Edited work Feminist Epistemologies, 1993 relates some of this groundbreaking work to traditional epistemology. An additional development of feminist epistemology is feminist philosophy of science. What are some of John Stuart Mill's influential publications? In his System of Logic, 
1843, Mill added to formal logic a system of evidentiary proof to show how conclusions about matters of fact were justified. He also updated Francis Bacon's 1561-1626 analysis of causation and built on David Hume's 1711-1776 theory that causes are not logically connected to their effects and that causal relationships are no more than constant conjunctions of types of events. In Principles of Political Economy, 1848, Mill identified a gap between what was measured in economics and human values, such as the preservation of the environment and limited population. He argued that the ideal economy would be made up of worker-owned cooperatives. Mills on Liberty, 1859, was his most contested work because it was an attack on the leveling effects of social opinion. Mill thought that democratic societies imposed conventions on their members. That did not allow for much individual experimentation in lifestyles. His more conservative contemporaries objected to the freedoms of opinion he championed. As well as his idea that if what others consider a vice does not harm them, they have no right to interfere with an individual who practices it. His utilitarianism, 1861, argued for the greatest good for the greatest number of people, in which the greatest good is defined as happiness. His On the Subjection of Women, 1869, has endured as a classic feminist work. His last major work, Three Essays on Religion, 1874, was a rational perspective on religion, but was neither agnostic nor atheistic. Mill reasoned that there probably was a God, but that the amount of human suffering in the world made it unlikely that God was very benevolent toward human beings. Did all 19th century thinkers believe in progress? Thomas Edison, 1847-1931, certainly did. In 1876, when he set up his laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, he committed himself to a minor invention every 10 days and a big thing every 6 months or so. Edison did get about 40 patents a year and over 1,000 before he died. Not everyone was so enthusiastic about new machines, though. Thomas Carlyle, 1795-1881, for example, wrote in 1829 in Signs of the Times. An essay that was published in the Edinburgh Review. The Signs being the Age of Machinery. That the shadow we have wantonly evoked stands terrible before us and will not depart at our bidding. Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, wrote in Walden, 1854. We do not ride upon the railroad, it rides upon us. Still, many did share Edison's optimism and it was the popular national view. Timothy Walker, a lawyer from Ohio, wrote in the North American Review in 
1831 that machines free ordinary people from burdensome labor and promote democracy. What is logical positivism? A new generation of thinkers who were influenced by Bertrand Russell. 1872 to 1970 and Ludwig Wittgenstein, 1889 to 1951, created a 20th century version of Augusta Kohn's. 1798 to 1857, 19th century intellectual endorsement of science. The term logical positivism was coined in 1930 by two supporters, E. Kyla and A. Petzal. Philosophers who were part of the early movement that logical positivism came to represent. The 20th century positivists Moritz Schlick, 1882-1936, Rudolf Carnap, 1891-1970, Otto Neurath. 1882 to 1945, and in England, A. J. Eyre, 1910 to 1989, were members of what became known as the Vienna Circle. Who were the Stoics and what did they believe? Stoicism was founded by Zeno of Sidium, 334-262 B.C.E., whose work was carried on by Cleanthes, 331-322 B.C.E., who was then succeeded by Chrysippus, c. 280-206 B.C.E. The name Stoic came from the Stoopoikil or painted colonnade, where Stoics first gathered in Athens. According to these early Stoics, the entire world is a morally good organism. With different phases in which events operate according to divine reason, or logos. The sequence of events is predetermined by fate. Each world phase ends in a big fire and is then repeated in a continuous, never-ending cycle. Early Stoic ethics held that only virtue is good, and only vice is bad. Other things, such as health or wealth, may be preferred, but they are morally indifferent. We each have a unique role in the world plan and our job is to learn what it is. Such learning creates concern for the self, which can and should be extended to close relatives and friends and, after them, all humanity. The Stoics may have been the first cosmopolitans. Learning is based on assent to impressions. Until all of a person's thoughts become related and unassailable by reason. By counseling that we assent to impressions, the Stoics meant that we should not deny anything that is presented to us as either a fact or an opinion but simply acknowledge its effect on us. Such Stoic certainty formed the dogmatism opposed by the skeptics. Why is Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed still considered a great philosophical text? Maimonides, 1135-1204, addresses his guide to contemporary educated men who were intellectually torn between the claims of Greek science and religion. 
Maimonides' intention in writing seems to be to help his readers understand philosophy without giving up their religion. To weed out or not upset readers who lack the mental firepower to follow his reasoning. He said that he deliberately scattered Aristotelian insights throughout the text. Instead of putting those together that first occurred together. He often stated both a position and its opposite. In other words, Maimonides' first step toward guiding those already confused was to deepen their confusion. But because Maimonides deepened existing confusion so brilliantly, his guide of the perplexed has attracted lasting scholarly disputation. How did Spinoza's system solve Cartesianism? Descartes' division between mind and body depended on the existence of two separate substances. Mind and material body, in addition to God. For Spinoza, there was but one substance, which was also God. That is, the human mind and the human body are the same exact thing, but are understood in different ways. We do not think of one thing as interacting causally with itself. So Cartesianism could not even get started as a problem in Spinoza's system. What were the important themes in early 20th century analytic philosophy? Analytic philosophy before World War II began with the rejection of British idealism via G. E. Moore's, 1873 to 1958, well-received common sense philosophy and a new rigor in theories of meaning. Introduced by the empiricist Bertrand Russell, 1872 to 1970. The doctrine of logical atomism as developed by Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein. 1889-1951, flourished for a while. Logical atomism was dependent on truth functional logic for its explication. In other words, analytic philosophers generally turned to logic as the science par excellence that set the standard for philosophy. What do critics of the deep ecological and animal value views claim? William F. Baxter, a law professor who passed away in 1998, argued in People or Penguins. The case for maximum pollution, 1974, that the cost of a pollution-free society would be harmful to humans. He assumed that humanism requires that humans are what matter above all else. Baxter expressed a general critical view of environmentalism held by human beings who do not believe that animals have intrinsic worth or rights equal to those of humans. Who was Bernard Bosanke? Bernard Bosanke, 1848-1923, was an English Hegelian who taught at University College. 
from 1870 to 1881, and at St. Andrews, from 1903 to 1908, Oxford. His name was inherited from French Huguenot forebears. He left Oxford when an inheritance enabled him to pursue social activist causes in London. His major works appear as the published editions of the Gifford Lectures that he gave in 1911 and 1912, The Principle of Individuality and Value, 1912, and The Value and Destiny of the Individual, 1913. Bosanquet explained the existence of the Absolute with his own system of logical doctrines. He advocated for community values as opposed to individualism. And he was the leading British philosopher of aesthetics in his day and beyond. What was anti Aristotelianism? Anti-Aristotelianism was a reaction against the ways in which medieval interpretations of Aristotle, 384-322b CE, had for centuries been accepted unquestioningly by Catholic scholars. What was the Native American philosophical tradition? There are as many Native American philosophies as there are distinct nations and tribes. Over most of its history, their philosophies were transmitted orally from one generation to the next. As American indigenous cultures and tribes were destroyed by war and the loss of ancestral lands. These transmissions were largely lost. Some transmissions were recorded by early anthropologists in condescending ways that distorted them. There are contemporary attempts to reconstitute Native American traditional oral knowledge. As critiques of Western philosophy, religion, technology, and economics. Such critiques now form the content of Native American or Indigenous American studies. As well as the late 20th century philosophical subfield of Native American philosophy. However, the speeches of 18th and 19th century Native American leaders who sought to resist removal to reservations and preserve the lives, cultures, and lands of their peoples endure as unreconstituted early American philosophy. Noteworthy in this regard is T. Diuskin, who, when he spoke at treaty councils in Pennsylvania, began, I desire all that I have said, may be taken down aright. T. Diuskin. Tenskwatawa, and Sago with us spoke like Americans. What was logical atomism? The main claim of logical atomists was that the world is made up of logical facts. These logical facts are like atoms because they can't be divided into smaller facts. Single logical facts can be combined by truth functional logic into molecular facts. To apply the theory of logical atomism to more complex statements such as the claims of science, the method of logical construction was posited. 
In logical construction, NES represents a logical construction of PS if statements about S can be reduced to atomic statements about PS. For example, a salad is a logical construction of its ingredients. And perceptions of ordinary objects are logical constructions of sense data. Bertrand Russell, 1872 to 1970, and Ludwig Wittgenstein, 1889 to 1951, were the main proponents of this perspective. Who was Nicholas Malbranche? Malebrink, 1637-1715, was a rationalist, like René Descartes, 1596-1650, who tried to solve the problem of how the mind and body interact. Who was Franz Brentano? Franz Brentano, 1837-1917, taught in Würzburg and at the University of Vienna. Influencing Austrian philosopher Alexius Menon, 1853-1920. What are some details of the Marquis de Sada's life? De Sada was born in the palace of Condet. His father was a count, his mother a lady-in-waiting to the princess. He attended a Jesuit college and was captain of a cavalry regiment in the Seven Years' War. After which he married the elder sister of the woman he loved, fathering two sons and one daughter. In 1766 he had a theatre constructed at his castle in Lacoste, in the 1990s. Fashion designer Pierre Cardin acquired the ruins of de Sada's castle as a site for theatre productions. He was a libertine, said to have sexually abused young people of both sexes, both servants and prostitutes. He was accused of kidnapping and abusing a woman named Rose Keller in 1768, after she escaped. He was also accused of blasphemy, which was a more serious offense at the time than the sexual crimes. When prostitutes in Paris complained of de Sada's abuse, he was exiled to his castle. Then he had an affair with his sister-in-law for which his mother-in-law secured an arrest warrant from the king. A series of arrests and escapes in which his wife was his accomplice ensued. He was confined to an insane asylum at Charenton after being imprisoned in the Bastille. In the asylum, the abbey allowed him to produce plays. When he was released in 1790, his wife divorced him. What are some highlights of Johann Gottlieb Fichte's career? As a student at Leipzig University, Fitch studied Benedict de Spinoza's 1632-1677 philosophy. After he discovered Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, to 
he wrote an attempt at a critique of all revelation. 1792, in which he tried to show that morality was the major part of religion. This was inspired by Kant's view that an understanding of morality requires an understanding of religion. How did Nicolaus Copernicus change the world? Nicolaus Copernicus, 1473-1543, changed how educated human beings viewed the world by constructing the heliocentric theory of Earth's relation to our Sun. According to the heliocentric theory, which is now considered common knowledge, Earth and the other planets revolve around the Sun. This heliocentric theory replaced the Ptolemaic geocentric theory, which held that that the Sun and other planets revolve around Earth. Copernicus became dissatisfied with the Ptolemaic system after his travels in Italy at a time when there was a lively revival of interest in ancient Pythagorean. Theories about the metaphysical importance of number for all aspects of nature. The Ptolemaic system was not mathematically elegant. But in Copernicus' day the church subscribed to the Ptolemaic theory. Because that was the description of the cosmos given in the Bible. Was anything absolutely wrong in Aristotle's view? Yes. Aristotle thought that some actions were wrong in themselves and did not allow for moderation or for a mean for example, adultery and murder. Was Newton an eccentric personality? According to historical anecdotes and gossip, the answer would have to be yes. There is evidence that Newton, 1642 to 1727, was eccentric and did not interact well with Auth ERS. His main quirk was his secretiveness about his work. He did not even communicate the success of his early research to others until 1669. To this day. It is not clear when he did what or which recorded intuitions correspond to what publications. After he got the position of Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge, except for three or four weeks a year. He spent 26 years in Cambridge, lecturing on optics and elementary mathematics. That is, his life was somewhat sheltered. Part of the reason Newton hated to publish was that he did. Not like the controversy that was always likely to follow. When in 1684 the Royal Society appointed a committee, led by Edmund Halley, 1656-1742. To remind Newton of his commitment to publish Principia Mathematica. Halley had to persuade him to include the third book, which contained the application of his system. Newton at first wanted to suppress that work because he had heard that Robert Hooke 1635 to 1703, claimed to have had the same system before him. Indeed, 
when Newton had related his discoveries about the decomposition of light. Or what the components of light are, to the Royal Society in 1672. Robert Hooke and others disagreed with part of how he explained his findings. Newton refused to discuss the matter or publish his work until after Hooke died. The Principia manuscript was finally delivered by a Dr. Vincent, husband of Miss Story, at whose house Newton had lodged in his teens. Apparently she had been the sole romantic interest in his entire life. Biographers relate that Newton had a psychological breakdown from 1692 to 1693. Following unsuccessful attempts to get a prestigious and lucrative government position through the efforts of his friend Charles Halifax. Newton wrote to Samuel Pepys, 1633-1703, that he was extremely troubled at the embroilment he was in and that he would have to withdraw from Pepys and his other friends. He then wrote to John Locke, 1632-1704, apologizing for being of the opinion that you endeavored to embroil me with women. Locke was kind and reassuring and Newton apologized further, claiming overwork and lack of sleep. Apparently, there had been no basis in fact for Newton's belief in having been embroiled. Newton did have an embroiled dispute over whether he or Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. 1646-1768 had first invented the theory of flux ions or the differential calculus. Through his office as president of the Royal Society, Newton exerted influence over the investigation of the matter, which was finally resolved to credit him with the discovery. Although it misrepresented the time sequence of correspondence on the subject between Newton and Leibniz, Newton did no further scientific work after his position as Warden of the Mint. He referred to natural philosophy as a litigious lady and mentioned another pull at the moon. He was apparently preoccupied with occult readings of biblical prophecy and alchemical theories. Although the nature of these endeavors is still unclear because he often wrote in code. Some contemporary scholars now think that these occult studies were Newton's main interest and that the greatness of his scientific achievements was largely the result of hype, after the fact. Newton's reluctance to publish or even continue his studies after he became warden of the mint might be less a matter of psychological instability than is often assumed. How did Edmund Husserl distinguish between two types of the self? First, Husserl explained that there is the psychological ego or the self that owns or makes the intentional acts of consciousness. The psychological ego exists in the world, because one can be aware of it as a self. But there is also the transcendental ego for which there is a world end. Which is concerned about truth the transcendental ego intends the world. The transcendental ego makes it possible for the psychological ego to exist and it determines how it will function. How did Elaine Locke apply pragmatism to issues of race and culture?
Locke was interested in values and valuation, cultural pluralism, and race relations. He argued that each cultural group has a distinct identity, which should not conflict with the citizenship of its members in a wider whole. Thus, African Americans could have the cultural identity, IES. Supported by the Harlem Renaissance and remain Americans. This model of identity was the intellectual foundation of Locke's efforts in promoting black culture. But some now view it as an applied pragmatic strategy. Locke believed that black identity was largely the result of economic and political forces and not biology. However, his pragmatic strategy was not to argue this belief directly, but to promote an understanding of race as culture within a broader society that emphasized false biological notions of race toward the goal of eventual racial equality. What was Friedrich Schelling's major thesis? Schelling believed that the entirety of nature, physical as well as mental, was mind on the way toward consciousness. But consciousness, or the human self, is the creator of nature. Life cannot be explained in mechanistic or inert terms. Schelling resurrected a type of alchemical thought whereby magnetism, which is the general form of particular existence, either becomes evident in light or maleness, or else becomes evident in heavy inertia, or femaleness. In ordinary language, although there was nothing ordinary about this belief, the alchemists believed that things that exist are all made up of a magnetic something that can manifest itself in either lightweight and airy or male beings, or else in heavy and dense or female beings. He believed that existent reality became separated from the absolute in a spontaneous act of freedom, which created time itself along with the world as we know it. That is, there occurred in the absolute a spontaneous burst of freedom that resulted in the separation of what we perceive as reality from the absolute. Another consequence was the appearance of time. This is to say that the absolute exists outside of time. Schelling had a following among romantics in the sciences, as well as in the arts because romantics in the 19th century, as today, loved quasi-mystical explanations of the world. Lawrence Oaken, 1774-1851, for example, postulated that all of life in Schelling's sense in which nature is unconscious mind, originated in primeval slime. The connection between Oaken's idea and Schelling's thought is not at all clear, except to indicate how one wild set of ideas is capable of inspiring others. Who was David Hume? David Hume, 1711-1776, was the first philosopher in the Western tradition to construct a system of thought that had no intellectual reliance on God. His atheism was not merely a matter of personal belief, 
but was based on an application of skepticism to claims that the existence of God could be known by reason. Hume extended that skepticism to the nature of knowledge about the world, as well. And showed how limited our knowledge of both cause and effect, and the future, really is. He was the first, thoroughly modern, naturalistic philosopher. Why were the great 17th century philosophers and scientists bachelors? They were either relatively poor, Descartes, Spinoza, Locke, or prohibited from marrying because they were priests. Fathers Marin Mercenet 1588-1648 and Pierre Gassendi 1592-1655. Or it was a tradition for men of learning not to have their own families. For example, Oxford dons were not allowed to marry at that time and the seven fellows of Gresham College. Founded in 1558, were all bachelors. Another reason might have been the prevailing beliefs about the nature of women. Women were not allowed to be scholars and wives and family life was not only considered a distraction for men of learning. But sexual relations were believed to be intellectually weakening for scholars. What did George Berkeley mean when he said, to be is to be perceived? In Berkeley's view of what exists in the world, there are only three things, minds, ideas, and God. Angels are also minds, and another way of dividing up the world is into spirits and ideas. Human beings, angels, and God are spirits. Everything else is ideas. Nothing else is known to exist. But If only spirits and ideas exist, how can there be a world? Berkeley thought that what we think of as an external world is just one idea added to our ideas of sense. No idea of sense can exist without being perceived by some mind. Berkeley's motto was Esse est percipi, or, to be is to be perceived. The idea of an external world is an isolated idea in itself, but no more than an idea. Furthermore, many of the ideas that we think we have, which support the existence of external reality, are no more than special distinct ideas combined with ideas of sense. For example, the ideas reality and physical matter are just words to which nothing like an external world corresponds. At best, they are merely additional ideas. This doctrine that reality is just another idea, in Berkeley's sense, is what made him the philosophical idealist par excellence. What is analytic philosophy? Analysis is a mental process that breaks down ideas, beliefs arguments or trains of thought, and systems of thought into their simpler components. Insofar as philosophy is about mental products in its own field and others, all philosophy is analytic. However, in American philosophy departments, and internationally, 
the term analytic philosophy has come. To designate 20th century mainstream philosophical thinking, as opposed to continental philosophy. Pragmatism, and subjects that now fall under new philosophy because they are recent additions to the field. What was Plato's view of love? Plato had two theories on love, one Platonic and the other not. In the Phaedrus he describes the development of passion between a mature man and a beautiful boy. The man's love for the particular beautiful person grows into a love of beauty in general. That general love of beautiful things becomes a love of the beauty in laws. And its final form is a love of beauty in thought, or the form of beauty. It should be remembered that the ancient Greeks prized what we would call homosexual and possibly pederastic relationships between beautiful youths and wiser older men. The older man was the lover, the youth the beloved. In Plato's version of such unions, their highest form was thus chastity. Or what came to be called Platonic love. In Plato's Symposium, Socrates credits Diotima with what he knows about love. Diotima has told him that love or eros is a spirit, the child of need and resource, or lack and plenty. Who was conceived at Aphrodite's, the goddess of beauty, birth, so love was born to love the beautiful. As the son of resource and need. It has been his fate to be always in need. Nor is he delicate and lovely as most of us believe, but harsh and arid, barefoot and homeless, sleeping on the naked earth. In doorways, or in the very streets beneath the stars of heaven, and always partaking of his mother's poverty. But, secondly, he brings his father's resourcefulness to his designs upon the beautiful and the good. For he is gallant, impetuous, and energetic, a mighty hunter, and a master of device and artifice at once desirous and full of wisdom. A lifelong seeker after truth, an adept in sorcery, enchantment, and seduction. The playwright Aristophanes is present at this discussion. And he gives an account of why love is so important to human beings. In the beginning, humans had three types that were each composed of two people conjoined in a spherical shape. Female and female, male and male, male and female. These creatures were very strong and tried to storm heaven itself. The gods did not want to destroy them, but something had to be done. Zeus' solution was to weaken them by cutting each of the beings in half. The result is that every human being is in search of their missing half. Men and women who were conjoined as hermaphrodites seek each other. Lesbians seek other women to complete themselves, and men who were joined to men are attracted to other men. Both Diotima and Aristophanes' explanations of love clearly involve sexual consummation and are not platonic. What did Henri Bergson have to say about laughter and the human sense of humor? Bergson wrote a 1900 analysis of laughter, 
which shows he was pretty interested in the concept of humor. He thought that the comical is a part of life that cannot be fully understood by reason alone. Laughter requires a state of indifference, according to Bergson. For laughter has no greater foe than emotion. He went on to say that the comic demands something like a momentary anesthesia of the heart. IT's appeal is to intelligence pure and simple. To be comical, something must be rigid, like a facial grimace or a mechanical walk. Our perception of this rigidity is broken up by our laughter. Ordinary language bears Bergson out on this because we talk about being cracked up. Or broken up when something is funny. Anything that switches our attention from the soul or moral realm to the body can be comical. Said Bergson, for example, a speaker sneezing at a dramatic moment in his presentation. Bergson saw the overall purpose of comedy as a reassertion of life in an age of machines. What was or is natural law? Natural law, or the law of nature, is a set of rules for human actions. Usually posited as having a divine source. As a universal moral and political code, Natural law was first conceptualized by Stoic philosophers who believed that natural law was part of the fundamental structure of the universe. Some early thinkers believed that natural law applied to animals as well as humans. Christian theorists later took up the idea of natural law as self-evident principles of human behavior that could be known only by rational beings. Thomas Aquinas C. 1225 to 1274 thought that human reason could reveal God's intentions for how we ought always to conduct ourselves so as to preserve the common good, or the good of the community. Following natural law is an important part of obedience to God. The particular laws of nations and peoples might differ. But the basic principles of natural law are universal. What were Ralph Waldo Emerson's requirements for a scholar? Emerson thought that much could be learned from ordinary experience and that spirituality was not separate from what was familiar or common. He did not have a high opinion of American academic philosophers. Dismissing their thought as derivative, but he did posit necessary conditions for a scholar. These are closeness to and experience with nature knowledge of the past and action as the clearest expression of thought emerson wrote that thinking is a partial act but living is a total act <laughs>